So uh, hi everyone. So I love to start with music. Um, I um, let me go ahead and welcome myself. I'm Lillian Adiemi. I am kind of in transition right now. I've been on vacation and I just got back yesterday, very late yesterday night. So I'm so excited to be here and to talk about one of my favorite subjects. And of course, it's about students and what we do um, in speech and debate. And especially in our activity, I think it's very important that we offer a safe space for our students upon their return next year, whatever that's gonna look like. I'm located in Houston and our judge just sent out a red notice. So um, I'm also the TFA president. So I'm dealing with a lot right now. I don't know where we are. I have anxiety right now about the season that's coming that is about to approach, but um, we're gonna talk about some things to help um, deal with it. And if you just noticed, I love starting my Zooms with my students last year with music while they wait. And so um, that was what I kind of did. And of course this topic today is reunited and it feels so good. So I'm also in transition, like I said earlier, because I'm no longer at this particular school that I'm in, in the building of right now. I've transitioned to a middle school. And so bear with me because everything that used to work is not working because I'm I don't have those privileges that I had previously. Um, but like I said, I'm Lillian Adiemi from Houston, Texas. And I am the, I was a formerly the coach director of forensics at Seven Lakes High School, um, which is actually a suburb outside of Houston and Katy. And um, now I've transitioned to full-time as a counselor um, now at Paul Revere Middle School um, in Houston Independent School District. So I'm cleaning out my classroom today. So that's all that's left behind us. But um, so yeah, I'm transitioning and the computer is not working like it used to work when I had privileges. So um, yeah, so I'm transferring my um, PowerPoint from there. But what we're talking about is anxiety. You're gonna be dealing with a lot of students that come to your, wherever, however you start, wherever you are and however you start your school year, whether it's in-person or not in per or virtual or hybrid, you know, we did a great job of pivoting last year's educators. And so what this, hour that I'm going to have you is for you to really take into mind that, that, that you're going to have to help your students pivot as well in this new world, whatever it looks like in the next month or two when you begin wherever you are. So I'm going to share my screen with me. I was saving it. Let me move. So my first question, uh, well, hold on. Sorry, you guys. Technology is not my favorite, but I'm getting better. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I'm old school, so I still have a flash drive. The problem was, because I always think that Google Slides, they change, it changes too much when you move from PowerPoint to, so I'm gonna share my screen real quick, really quickly and um, we can begin, but... Uh, Apologies. Okay. So while while um, I'm finding this thing on the flash drive, what the first thing I want you to think about is in your mind right now, and you can put it in the chat or you can say it verbally. If you could think of one quality that a teacher or a former boss or employer or principal, uh, what quality did they possess that made, um, that changed your life? One teacher, think of the teacher, first of all, think of the teacher or the employer or the boss, because I know everyone is at different stages. It could be a principal, it can be an, a coworker. What quality, think of that person right now, envision them in your head, and then think of the quality that they possess that helped change your trajectory in life, or made you a better educator, whatever. Think of that one quality and you can type that description of that quality they had or how they made you feel in the chat while I find this PowerPoint. <laughs> one quality that they had, one quality. Okay, I'm, I'm just gonna read it out. Oh, I love it. Caring, enthusiastic. Empathy, passion, reassurance, encouraging, intelligence, caring again, belief, challenged, I like that one, patience, understanding, confidence in me, 
understanding again. They saw me. Supportive. All right. This is the good thing right now. All right. Supportive. I see supportive again. Okay, I just don't know. He made me mad and then challenged me to prove him wrong, which taught me more about research than if it had instructed how in class. I guess the word should be challenging. Yes, definitely, Leslie. So challenging is definitely, I like the challenging. I think one thing about um, the educator or the professor or the principal or assistant principal, whatever employer that you had, what, all of these words encompass one thing. And that is basically, I think someone said it, they saw you. And that's the main thing about what the students are going to need when they come back into your buildings, into your virtual space, whatever they, whatever that looks like next year for you, they need the students always, everyone wants to be seen and felt like they're heard, right? Um, everyone wants to be seen, right? So it's so important that as educators, especially with the students, that they're they're going to have a lot of issues coming in next year. You guys, I this is like torture right now that I can't find this PowerPoint on the flash drive. So um, I'm just uh, stalling right now until like, it comes up. So it's in, important as educators that we find those moments where where we connect with our students. So let's get into the anxiety. I'm not here to take you to counseling school or to get your master's or PhDs in counseling. So we're not gonna get into the actual diagnosis because if the student is really exhibiting, exhibiting um, the things that, uh, that need additional help, you need to help them find that, that way. So let's just talk about what you're gonna be experiencing next year. Um, well, this school year that's coming up. COVID-19 did a lot. So, uh, and you're gonna type in the chat again until I find, what are some COVID-19 stressors that you've dealt with this year? Um, and you could just put it in the chat. Um, or if someone wants to raise their hand, you can also, what are some COVID, we wanna talk about you first. Let's talk about the COVID-19 stressors you dealt with as educators last year. And you could just put one word, whatever that may be. One word, two words, as many words. We're all gonna, um, oh, isolation. All right. Uh, being a parent, a teacher, and I'm not a teacher. Okay, isolation, a lot of isolation. Being ready to go out of school and go virtual at a drop of a hat. A disconnect with students. Constantly changing protocols. What are you telling me? I don't know if we're going to be masked up or masked out. Who knows? Am I doing this right enough? How do I get them to turn on their, their cameras off? <laughs> Nonstop grading. Nine different schedules. Ooh, Adam. Woo. Wow. Protocols changing. Constant change in learning platforms. All right. So and you don't have to type this. Um, so we talked, you see all the things that we dealt with as educators and we're the professionals in the room, right? The students come to us to learn. See some other people, okay, people are typing. Canvas is not a new four letter. <laughs> we did Canvas too. I actually got good at Canvas. As an extrovert, I now struggle with crowds. Wow. Having constant contact from students and parents, even at home. Give about two more minutes. Um, for people, if you want to add anything, the struggles you faced or the things that you, sh you faced last year. Having constant contact from students and parents, even at home. My four letter word is Schoology. <laughs> I think Schoology and Canvas are about the same. <laughs> when it comes to stuff. Being on call 24 seven, hmm. About one more minute 
do you want to put how, what um, kind of gave you those moments, the, the stressors, what stressed you? We're putting our COVID stressors as educators from last year. You want to type something. Extra time and work on technology for asynchronous hybrid schedule, ever-changing lesson plans, lack of interaction, increased criticism from parents and admin, admin. All right, anybody else wanna put one last thing, their COVID-19 stressors as educators. All right, so raise your hand if um, you also had to do this while, or any, by the way, if you don't know how to raise your hand, it's under the reactions at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Raise your hand if you also had to deal with this while juggling a speech and debate team. I just wanna see who are the speech and debate, because I know everyone's not in here, the speech and debate. Keep your hand raised for me. Okay, I see some people on screen are waving. Wow, okay. All right, so you can lower your hand, thank you. So on top of all the ever-changing schedules, the admin, the, the parents constantly having 24 seven, those are the stressors that we face, you guys, and we're adults, we've been in this profession. Now, take your mind back, close your eyes if you're, and take your mind back to trying to survive the pandemic, college apps, social media, um, I'm trying to think of, a th I'm telling my age, I was born, you know, I graduated in 97. So, um, college apps, social media, speech and debate or basketball or whatever extracurricular activities, take your mind back and try to think of that your 16 year old self in the pandemic. So that is what our kids are dealing with there. I think their stresses are even more to another level. Think of, Look how much we wrote down and we're adults, you know, having to deal with this. So la this is what our kids are basically facing. Separation from their friends. Someone puts isolation, right? Separation from their friends. Missing the stability of school. There's a lot of stability of coming to school from eight to three or seven to four or nine to five or whatever. Loneliness. And someone put that in there. Economic anxieties, right? They don't know if their parents are gonna lose their job, right? Like, are, uh, you know, um, will we be able to afford the Wi-Fi for me to go to school? Fears about the pandemic. And uh, going back to economic uh, anxieties, like food scarcity, you know? Um, a lot of people, um, I one thing I love about educators, we were the only profession really to pivot without having like a board meeting, right? We pivoted in, during the pandemic. We just like, we went to spring break and spring break became three months, <laughs> right? Uh, right, and we just had to pivot, right? Because as educators, that's what we do. That's what we're asked to do, right? So it's important, um, food scarcity is a big thing for a lot of kids, especially if you're in a low socioeconomic school district or you know, like a title one type school, you're, you're, you're asking students to do research and they're like, I don't know what I'm, where my next meal is coming. Okay, grief and loss, if they lost, lost a loved one um, because of the pandemic. And then of course, um, the academic stresses, right? Because even though we had to pivot to virtual or hybrid school or, you know, um, they still had to apply for college. They still had to take the SATs. They still had to, um, you know, get their cases for my team, get their cases ready on time for a tournament that was online this weekend all while doing this during a pandemic. So the academic stresses were um, big. And the biggest one I think for a lot of the kids, especially during this pivotal time is those missed milestones, homecoming, prom, graduation, or you know, virtual graduation. So um, I just want you to really take a, think about all those stressors that, they, that students are dealing with. So, and then that's just the COVID-19 stressors. There's a big term that's out there in um, psychology right now called adverse childhood experiences. And basically adverse, they call it, you'll, you'll, hear, you'll hear a lot of your counselors and your mental health professionals on staff, uh, staff at your school saying ACEs. Make sure, you know, we still have to deal with the ACEs, right? And those ACEs are 
sexual abuse, witnessing violence, sexual abuse, um, verbal abuse, all those different things. And then of course, housing, housing insecurities. So this is what's coming to your classroom in a few weeks, right? And somehow we have to keep them engaged. And a lot of you talked about what kept you engaged at school or what made your, um, what made your teachers and um, administrators memorable is that they saw you. And so the one thing I want you to take away is it's very important to see the students this school year, see them for um, exactly what they have in the room because they're going to come at you at different levels, right? And, um, and we're going to get to that and talk about why um, anxiety looks so different for us because all of y'all named all those stressors, but look, we're back here in a professional development on Zoom. You know, you've been here, this is the third day and you're here because you still want to learn. You still want to um, get better at what you do and you didn't want to give up. And that's the same type of mentality you have to give to your students um, when they come into your classrooms next year. So um, the way anxiety, and I'm not gonna take, take a deep dive. So when our students come to us, the main thing you have to understand is the way that they communicate to us, okay? They communicate to us different ways. We're all communication teachers, most of us in here. So we know that there's two ways to communicate, verbally and non-verbally, okay? And anxiety is like, and I had a beautiful PowerPoint, you guys, with the duck waddling, but it's not here on the flash drive. Uh, technology. <laughs> so think about it. A lot of your students, and especially for the speech and debate students I see, they will operate with anxiety all inside their body. But you will never know. They will never tell you. Because on the outside, you know, we teach them how to look the part. We teach them how to dress the part. We teach them how to speak the part. And inside, they are a mess. Their brain is running on circles. They're thinking like, am I going to get into college? Am I going to get... It's, um, you know, um, I have to get first this weekend to qualify for state. I have to do this. I have a test. So they're like, our kids are literally a lot of times anxiety, especially in high functioning students, like in the speech and debate world, they're like that duck on the pond, but underneath that water, woo, it's, a, they're like barely keeping afloat, juggling all these different balls, right? So it's important that you understand that their behavior when they get into what our brain, what happens in our brains when we have anxiety for any reason is that we're no longer thinking with our frontal cortex, we're thinking with our amygdala, amygdala right? So our amygdala is saying, you're not gonna get first. You're gonna get a zero on that test. You're not prepared for this tournament this weekend. Oh my God, you know when you get to class, coach such and such is gonna yell at you because you didn't cut your cards. Oh, oh my goodness, when you get to class, your teammate is going to be mad because, and again, they're thinking about all the other stuff, all those COVID stressors on top of the ACEs, right? So this is what anxiety does to our students or what it does to any child or even us, right? So it's important um, that we know the responses. So you have those kids that you, you'll never be able to tell that they are thinking about all, all that is running through their mind. You'll have those students like that. They'll never tell you, you would never know that, um, you know, that they're so stressed until maybe they finally show it in, in non-verbally. But most students, they can, they can function and you would never know. But as that amygdala likes to tell us to give other responses as well, right? So anytime we're feeling stressed or have anxiety, there's three responses that most of us know, and y'all know it, fight, flight, or freeze, right? But y'all heard the term fight. And I, by the way, I will make sure you get the PowerPoint to this. <laughs> I'll make sure the NSGA gets it to everyone. Um, I'll get it to Vicki or um, Lisa or Amber um, when I'm done. I'm so sorry that I'm having to do this verbally. I'm looking at it. Um, I, it's just not here. <laughs> so uh, it's just it's just not. I'm, I can't find it. So fight, flight, or freeze. So remember, I said they students operate two ways: fight, flight, or freeze. Fighting, we're gonna now only talk about how they operate for the students that you're gonna see that don't tell you. Because again, if they the thing about it is we're gonna get to why how they get to tell you, but you have to understand 
that when students act a certain way, a lot of time they're choosing one of those three ways to respond to the anxieties that they're bringing to the classroom, okay? So usually when a student is operating from the fight, they might actually be physically aggressive or they might be verbally abusive or aggressive to either, probably not to you per se, but maybe to a teammate, maybe they might just blow up one day in class and you're just like, what's going on, right? Because something is going on internally that they brought to the class and their only way to express it is, phys is, is maybe verbally or physically of being aggressive. Hopefully not physically, but typically verbally, right? Um, younger kids, if you're a middle school, uh, they might do like silly things like throw stuff, they might shout. So it's gonna be, it's gonna, it's gonna show in a different way. And it's very important that you understand that that's just how some students deal with when they're at that fight stage. Okay. And the flight, if they decide to flight, this is where you have the students who don't turn in their work. Right? Um, they run away, they want to hide. When you're in a flight stage, you want to run away. You don't want, you don't even have the energy to do the work. Like, um, I, and I'm going to be totally candid. Um, after the pandemic, during the pandemic, I graduated from grad school on top of being the TFA president. <laughs> you guys, I didn't think I was going to make it. Like, I was like, I'm not, it's a wrap. I, I was telling, I had a, thank goodness. And we're going to talk about these relationships that you build. Thank goodness I had, I call them my, my crew in grad school. Every day I'm like, I'm going to extend, I'm going to drop this course and I'm just going to graduate in the spring. I was like, I can't do it. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. I was zoomed out. I was just zoomed out. Right. And, um, I just, I was getting to the point where, um, not necessarily I was, I was hiding from my work. I was more at the third point where you just freeze. You can't do nothing. Right. You're stunned. Like your teacher tells you to do the work. You look at the work, you know, it's due. You know, you have to cut the cards. You know how you have to do this. You know, you have to do this math test. You know, you have to study, but you're at the stage where you're just stunned. And all you can do is just sit there and you're almost in a can catatonic state. And you're just like, I don't even have the energy or the brain capacity to do whatever my teacher asks me to do. Okay. So what happens is you begin to whine. Okay, this is the freezing people. They whine about like, oh, coach A, can I just turn it in tomorrow? And I'm giving examples of some of my kids. Coach Adiyami, I didn't turn, or you know, they whine or they clean, or you have your students that just emotionally withdraw. They just totally check out. Like they'll be in your room, but not in your room. You know, you have those students or they'll be on Zoom and, <laughs> right? You don't like when that camera's off, you don't know what they're doing. I remember um, I had a policy. Somebody put in there, get their get the kids to turn on their cameras. Because I, I teach speech, that was a policy that they signed a contract at the beginning that when they come to class, their cameras must be on. And what I would do to prepare the students that had anxiety, right? I would play music. And you know, today I played the instrumental of Peaches and Herb Reunited. But typically I would play like Kanye West, like bring them out, bring them out like different music or like um, on a Friday I would play, it just depends on whatever we're talking about. I would play music with my camera off and they knew and I would take role because I was hybrid. So I had students sitting in my classroom and I had students online every day, every period at the same time. So of course I was zoomed out last year. And so I would just play music and they knew that the, as long as the music is playing, they could gather their thoughts. And for those students that were really camera shy, they can prepare themselves that they know it's a safe space. And Miss Adiemi, when her camera comes on, I can bring my camera. So that was something that, and I never had a problem. And they knew if they turned their camera off, I would just first send a chat, turn your private chat, turn your camera on. They knew that if I, then I, if they still didn't do it, I will poke them or whatever you do on Zoom. And then by the third one, I would verbally say, Tasha, Kenny, can you please turn on your camera? And I would just say it, and I wouldn't, I would be like, you know, I could be like, so yeah, lack of interaction. Tasha, can you please turn on your camera? Uh, early onset adulting, a lot of kids, if Tasha doesn't turn on her camera, she would get put in the waiting room. And my kids knew that. They knew that was the, you get, cause that means that you still need time to get right for Miss Adiani's class. And again, you have to get to that point. And we're gonna talk about that. Um, of how you get to that point. 
So like I said, commu students communicate with us with their anxieties in very, two very different ways. Um, so fight, flight, or freeze. And then the fourth one is a new one. And it's called, it's a new one that uh, psychologists have added called flocking. So kids can also flock. And I'm the master of flocking because like all of the, the things you placed at the top, supportive, they saw me, challenging, right? Um, em empathy, belief. This is where you have to get to with every single student that comes to your class next year, whether it's in your classroom or in Zoom. We all have our bad days, right? There's days when I come to class and I, I even tell the kids, I'm so, I'm so candid. I'm like, y'all, I'm tired. Today, we. <laughs> I'll just be like, this is what it was last year. I was like, Miss Adiemi's tired. They would come to the Zoom. I was like, Miss Adiemi's tired today. I just can't do Zoom. <laughs> and they're like, okay, Miss A. I was like, take care of your speeches. I'll see y'all tomorrow. And I was just in the Zoom five minutes, right? Because it would be a day where I was just like, I don't feel like being on this camera. You know, I don't feel like being in this Zoom space because speech and debate, we're on it. You know, speech and debate tournaments. We're in tab rooms and watching videos. I just was so cameraed out. And my kids knew that some days, class may be five minutes and you get a day to, you know, we just take roll and you leave. So you, and I think um, the flocking is the, the part where it helps deregulate students. See, because when they come with all their anxieties, they come so um, wound up, right? Tension. And remember, so the fight, flight, and um, freeze looks very different, right? Um, Amber might, her flight might be just putting her head down and going to sleep in class. Whereas Vicky, she may say, Miss Adiemi, can I go to the nurse office? Miss Adiemi, can I go to the bathroom? Um, Miss Adiemi, um, so it looks different for every student. So it's very important that when you make the space very welcoming so they can flock to you. And the flocking response is basically co-regulation. You are the person that helps them get back to the place where they know that they're safe where they know that they're seen, what they're, where they know that they're heard, at least for those 45 minutes or hour, if you're on block scheduling, hour and a half, 90 minutes in your classroom. If you can make every student feel that way for 90 minutes, 40 minutes, however long, 30 minutes, however long you have them, you got them. They have now flocked to you. They will run through a wall for you. Even on their bad day, they, they know they can come to you and say, Miss A, I'm not feeling good today. So, or they can text you, I'm not feeling really good today. Please don't call them. Or I'm not feeling good today. Can I just put my head down? And um, of course my kids know they don't get to put their head down, but if a child tells me they need to put their head down and they need to, they need at that, that moment, that 40 minutes just to just get back to green or get back to where they're, they can cope with the next period. You give them that, you give them that. It's so important that you give them that, okay? So our goal this year um, is to get to that stage of where you talked about all the wonderful educators you had in the past and get to where students are saying that about you, that they feel safe, that they feel heard, that they feel wanted when they come into your classroom. No matter all of those stressors that are going on in the world, you can definitely reach them if you just, and we're gonna talk about some of the things you can do. I, like I said, I'm not trying to make you a counselor per se, if the, the problems are, are, if the behavior continues, I'm gonna say this, this precursor, if the behavior really, really continues, then you need to get um, call like their, their counselor and get them involved and let them know what you've been observing. This is for the students that they're just having a bad day. You had a bad day. I break out in song a lot. So <laughs> my students are used to it. So yeah, sometimes we all have a bad day, right? Um, and so, it, you know, you can give them that. If it's, but if the, if, and I'm not going to say this, if the symptoms are persistent, meaning most of us have our students for a year um, where there, you think there needs to be a diagnosis. Typically, if you see it for almost three months, um, constantly, then they definitely need to be seen. It should, you should be able to 
um, before three months period. If they're having it, if they're having a bad day for 30 days in the school, 30 days back to back consecutively, yeah, they can't have a bad day every day, right? You got to get them back to where they're co-regulated um, and they're with you in the class present here. Because see, what happens is the anxiety equation is this for everyone. And this is even for adults, right? Overestimation of a threat, the underestimation of your ability to cope with that threat, and then what, what ends up happening while, what, while we get to that fight, flight, freeze, is that our, that's our response of that brain that doesn't, this brain does nothing. It's just there. I think I like, I like to say he put it there for when we were cavemen, right? We need that like when we're walking down the street and we're about to walk into traffic. That amygdala says, step back. You see that car is about to run you over. But you have to get students to get here. And in order to get here, here's some, and again, you'll get this PowerPoint, this beautiful PowerPoint that it, um, my best friend's in the room right now. She's going to have to find it on my computer. <laughs> but um, you want to get to the point where you ask your students when they really, when you've really gotten them to flock to you and to be honest and candid with you, you want to ask and don't tell. Very important. So basically what I'm going to help you do today is become worry wise teachers or worry wise educators. So we're going to get to a point where when a student is having those, having that bad day, you want to ask and don't tell, right? You want to ask them because they're worried about something. So you want to ask them questions and don't tell them how to respond. So what is worry telling you? So what are your thoughts telling? What, what, what is, what is the worry telling you? What is, you know, or is that what you really think? Why? Okay, really, really questions that, and they'll just talk to you and like, cause usually once, once you ask questions and just not tell them what to do, but ask them a question to let them think, eventually what happens is they stop thinking back here and move to the frontal cortex and really look at the situation for what it is. All right. Um, do you think that's really true? Why or why not? Do you think that's true? Like when a kid comes to you and says, Sadiemi, I'm never going to break. I'm like, do you think that's really true? Why do you think that? Or, you know, just, you know, I'm thinking about things that students said. I mean, I never, like I said, I never saw any of my students last year. They were all on Zoom for my speech and debate team. But, you know, or, why do you think it's more likely for you not to break? Because then all of a sudden they're like, well, you're right, I do work hard. Because what happens is they'll start talking back to you like, wait, I do work hard. And you're right, I am good enough. You know, they'll just start talking back to you because again, they're thinking, what if I mess up? This is what their worry brain is saying. What if I mess up? I, oh, I'm, oh, I'm about to start freaking out. What, what if I don't get it right? What if... uh? What if that person's in the room with me? Oh, my interprets do that all the time. They'll look at that room, the sectioning, and they're like, oh my goodness, the national champion's in my room. Oh my goodness, such as, I'm like, Yo, they got two legs. They put on pants, one pant leg at a time. Go in there and go perform and stop worrying about other people and do what you do. <laughs> okay, and or they, or a lot of, oh, the worry brain also likes to tell the kids what's gonna happen next. What if I don't break? What if I don't get into that college? What if I don't, um, what if I don't um, make the squad? What if I don't, what if I'm not captain? So that's what the worry brain is saying to them. So I, the first tool is ask questions. Don't tell them what to do, ask them questions. So they can get from here to they start thinking, okay? So that court, the frontal cortex, because the brain has like two tracks, right? Our, we're, we have a two track mind, the truth track and the worry track, period. We only have two tracks what the truth is, and you're trying to get them off of the worry track by asking them questions to the truth track, okay? Get them off of that worry track to the truth track. You want to get them, because once they get to the truth, they'll start, you know, they're like, oh, you're bright beside me. Okay. And then look, when they break, this is what I love, when they like break or something ha good happens, they're like, Miss A, you were right. I was like, I wasn't right, you did it. <laughs> like, I wasn't right. Miss Adiyam, you were right, you were so right. We'll give an example. I had a student come to me, and um, this is second semester. 
Um, she was the captain of our, she was in, she's not on my speech and debate team. She's in my, one of my, um, my prof comm classes. Perfect example of the student. And it's funny because they, you know, they, again, I make my, my class very open and honest. So she came to me and told me that she was waitlisted. Okay, I'm from Texas, you guys. And there's two schools in Texas, right? UT and a and <laughs> And if they don't get into those two schools, the world is, they are on that worry track. The world is over. There's no other university. I mean, there's no Baylor. I was like, no, there's TCU, Baylor. And they could get into those schools, but if they don't get into UT, life is over. So this particular student, she got into TCU, she got into Baylor, she got into a and but she wanted to get into UT. <laughs> University of Texas, Austin, right? So she comes to me and she's like, hey, Miss A, and she, you know, after school, she was like, um, I didn't get into, I got waitlisted for UT. They're telling me that I need to go to, and UT does that sometimes. They'll waitlist a student and tell them they can come in, but they have to go to like one of the other UT campuses. So she was like, they want me to go to UT. I can go to any of the other UT branches for a year and then I can transfer to UT. I was like, I was like, oh, okay. I was like, she was like, so I'm trying to appeal the, you know, to how to get in or whatever, right? So she was telling me this because she didn't come to school the day before and that was why. So let me start with that. So she said she got, when she got, that she was waitlisted because her brother goes to UT. She got into AM, like I said, she got into AM. No, she got into AM, SMU, and U of H. But she got waitlisted for UT, the school she really wanted to go to. So she was on that worry track. Like she was all the way on the worry track that it, she shut down and had to stay home from school. So she was explaining to me why she wasn't at school the previous day. And she was like, I'm just like, I just can't believe I didn't get in and, you know, on the worry track. And I was like, okay, what is this worry telling you? I think I told her, I was like, what is this telling you? What, what, what is this worry telling you? What, why are you worried? And she says, well, I mean, then she tells me her brother goes to UT. You know, he got in. Um, a lot of my friends got in, but I didn't. So it was just all of that comparison, which kids do a lot of, right? That social media is the death of them, right? that compare imposter syndrome, what they call, right? Imposter syndrome, right? Thinking that you're not good enough. So anyway, I told her, I said, so then I kind of, I was like, okay, well, let me see your grades. Let me see your resume. And we kind of broke it down. I went to counselor mode. And I was like, do you want to, she was like, I want to appeal. I was like, oh, so she was like, but my counselor was telling me that, um, you know, you know, you barely, you know, it's hard to appeal. And other, I was like, I'm looking at your grades and I'm looking at your GPA. I was like, it was a mistake. You're going to get in. So after she got off, she was like, you think I can? I was like, no, I know colleges. If you appeal, you will get in. So we, she, she was like, she was like, okay. So what, she's like, will you mind writing? Would you mind looking at my essay? They told me to write a different essay. I'm like, of course I got you. You know, it's oratory, right? It's oratory. So <laughs> that's what we did. I was like, oh, it's oratory. I got you, girl. So she did a wonderful essay, send it to me. We revised it. But before we did that, she was all the way off the word track. Cause I was like, you're going to get in. I'm telling you you're going to get in. I was like, sometimes they have to take a second look. And she showed me all her essays that she did. And she was like, okay. I was like, believe that you're gonna get in, you're gonna get in. So long story short, we I called some people at UT, um, the people that are on the, the committee to get advice on how to approach the essay first. And then they told us, and then once we did that, she came back um, maybe a few days later, cause it was like, I think that was a Thursday or Friday. So we did the essay, she did it. And you like only get like 250 words or 300, 500 words or something. So she did it, great. She sent it in. Her counselor helped her with the other part, who's also a UT grad. They sent it in. You guys, I I tell my kids I'm always right. No, I'm joking. But she got in. When they the appeal process later on, she got in. She came crying. I got in. Oh, my God. Thank you so much. And I was like, yeah. I was like, but the thing about it, before I told her that she would probably get in, I was like, but I need you to understand if you don't get in, that it's not the end of the world, right? I was like, I had to tell her, you know, I was like, I really think you're gonna get in. And they made, you know, when they look, take a deeper look at your um, qualifications, because our school is so competitive, you could be a 4.0 and not in the top 10% of our of our campus. You could have to make straight A's the entire high school career and not be in the top 10%. So um, I'm sorry, top 8% to get into UT now. So I think she was like 11 or 10. And automatic admission is 8%. I say, you're going to get in. I say, you're going to get in. But I was like, if you don't, you could either go, you could, you're, you got into AM, you got into SMU, 
And you also, um, uh, you could also do the UTSA for a year and go. Cause I was like, guess what? You'll go to UTSA. I had students in other, my, other, my old school that went to UTSA for a year to go to UT and end up going to UTSA and loving it and graduating from UTSA, which is UT San Antonio. But of course, Austin is the, you know, the brainchild. So anyway, long story short, um, May 1st came around and she got, it. she was fully accepted to University of Texas. Austin, but I'm just say UT because they always say that's what say Austin because we're just UT. But she got into UT and it was a great, great story. But the main thing you have to know is had she not been able to flock to me, who knows where she would have gone, right? So you have to make um, your space, um, your classroom, wherever you see your students after school, if you don't have them in class, you have to make it a safe space for them to flock to you. Because you got to get them from that flight, flight, um, fight, flight, or freeze. The, the F's, the bad F's. We want to get them to the good F's at the end. So flocking is so important. And um, looking at my time. So flocking is so, so important. And why uh, students um, and helping them self regulate. I'm going to give you a little quote, real quick. A secure attachment figure is someone in a child's life who offers a continuity and security and who has the ability to soothe the child in times of stress. So that's all we have to do. We just have to soothe them and um, make sure that your space is effective because again, um, and there's different things, a lot of icebreakers. Um, I'm also gonna give you a, I, something that's really good to do. You know how we, um, I don't know if your school did self checks where the kids had to scan a little barcode and put their COVID symptoms in. Somebody talked about protocols. The in-person kids had to do that. I got a great idea from an elementary school teacher at a, and I don't have a classroom next year, but I got a great idea from an elementary school teacher. Instead of doing a barcode to check their COVID symptoms, have them scan a barcode outside your door, put a barcode, and it just scans their mood symptoms, right? So um, they, they scan it. They put their name every day. Every day they come to your class, just get them to scan that barcode. And then before class starts or while class is going on or while they're doing whatever they're doing in their sections, you can just pull up their, pull up your little um, Google doc and um, spreadsheet and you can see your the kids move when they come in your I was like, man, you're doing this in elementary. That was, I was like, if I was in the classroom, that is like clutch. Cause they always have their phones in high school, right? They whip out their phone. They love scanning QR code. Scan that QR code. You can put it on your screen at the beginning of the day. And it could just be like Mr. Pratt's mood check. Mood check, right? <laughs> so um, you could just put it on and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll send that to you as well. It's on the PowerPoint. Tasha, you got to find it. <laughs> I don't, I'm going to come to your house after this. But yeah, so um, put a QR code. Put a QR code. You can put it on your screen and that can be... Um, that can be something that they do every day they come to class. Put it outside your door. So they're checking them. They know, and they'll get used to it. My kids, first period, knew to scan that barcode first period, right? Every day, they would go straight to the, the bulletin board and scan the barcode. Um, and your barcode, and you can leave it up the whole year. And, and every day they do it, it'll do a different entry. And you can organize it. Um, uh, it's just a Zoom, like a, a Zoom thing. So... Um, that is, I thought that was clutch. I was like, oh my goodness. I, like if I had a classroom, I would so do that with my students because then you don't have, they don't have to talk to you. If they're in a bad mood, they just put a red face. You're like, okay, that's why they're acting like that. And then the thing is they can't put a red face every day. That's when you can kind of regulate where they're at if there needs to be more intervention. So that is a, definitely a tool you can use. I don't want to take up time. I want to leave some time for questions because I can talk. Um, if, if you have any questions um, that you have, maybe I can help Murphy's Law, no worries. Thanks. Sorry, I'm scrolling down. Um, in particular with kids in, in speech and debate in this world that we're going in, I don't even know what next year is looking like right now. Just Sorry, I, my worry brain is talking while I'm talking y'all <laughs> about, because um, in Texas, we start in T minus two weeks <laughs> competition. So. We're not like the other states that start after Labor Day, which would make sense, but you know, we're Texas. We're different like that. <laughs>
Uh, I would like to ask for advice on helping kids overcome performance anxiety. Ah, that's a great one, Leslie. Because in addition to coaching um, forensics, and this is middle school, so they're young. Mm -hmm. um, I also am the theater arts teacher. And this year I have already been informed we are expected to have not one, but two productions this year, full scale productions. I'm having my own anxiety with this because, uh, <laughs> yeah, and we're a new theater program um, prior to me being hired, and that happened the year of COVID, so. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so your, um, prior, your amygdala prior, is like a lot of questions right now, huh, Leslie? Let's just, let's just say that March 17th, 2020 is a day that shall live in infamy because that's when they shut us down. So anyway, um, I have dealt with kids that have performance anxiety in class just for doing simple things like a mime or something like that, where they don't even have to use their voices or read anything. But then I have kids that have serious anxiety. I mean, breathing difficulties, sweating, trembling, the whole nine yards. And yes, you can't get the counselor involved in all that, but what if this happens, you know, when they're performing or when we're at a tournament and I've got kids that are freaking out? Advice. Yeah, that's a good one. So um, you have to let them know what I would, what I tell my students for the ones that freeze when they do perform, it's okay. Like you have to let the, the whole point is right now when they're at that freeze stage, they're at the point where they want either want to freeze or they don't want to do anything, right? So you have to get them back, get get them back out of there. Don't they don't have to perform? And if they freeze, I mean, I even froze when I was a theater, I was a theater theater major in college. I froze even on stage sometimes. Um, it's going to take practice and of them getting used to. And I'm just oh, middle school, middle school so different. It's like the end of the world for them too. I don't know how you would deal with a student that froze on stage. Just tell them if they freeze, maybe to exit or the next person that's on stage with them to continue uh, the lines so they can get back if they're still on stage. And if not, you're gonna have to find a way to let them know that it's okay to freeze. Like it's okay. Like it's normal, we all do it. I froze in a production my senior year in college. I literally was on stage and I was like, it was a crazy play, a student rec, student director show. And I skipped the whole, the entire page. We're acting in the scene. And I was just like, I just went to page 52, what? And he just kind of looked at me, <laughs> we just kept going. Of course, middle school kids, it'll be a freak out moment for them. So it's very important that if they're sharing a scene with someone that the person in the scene knows if, that, if they happen to freeze on stage, the show must go on, if it's a live performance. Right. And and just get and that's also comes with when you guys are practicing for the show, get the practice. Yeah. Um, and oh, that's a good one. We did that in basketball when I play ball. Practice one if somebody freezes, like um, tell someone to figure the line. Right. Forget your line or skip to the next page. Or if someone freezes, they need to practice when someone freezes, especially the people that are sharing the stage with them, with the person that may freeze or a student that's very um very nervous. As far as students that are um, that are that are scared to perform for a competition or scared to perform in front of an audience. I had a student that was online and she didn't want to give a speech in person at all. She did not want to give a speech in person. She and she was kind of like um, she, not kind of she was a selective mute. So if you know what selective mutes are, they may speak at home but in school they won't speak at all. Or if they, if she even, if you've ever seen um, Bring, is it Bring It On? No, Pitch Perfect, the Pitch Perfect movie with the girls that sing, that sing. Remember the little girls, she talked like that one of the scenes, hi. So yeah, that's how she spoke. Like, and she was in the speech class with me. I was like, what am I gonna do? So I even um, talked to the counselor and I talked to some other classes, um, the teacher across the hall, the CTE teacher, she had her, had her as well and she never spoke in computer class. So um, 
you have to let those students, I, she, but she would, she would perform her pieces for me just one-on-one. So that's what we did at first. You guys, by the end of the semester last, and I had her in the fall, she was giving her speeches in front of the class. Again, if you let, if you let them know that you're there for them and get them from that worry in the back of their mind, because they, they all have it. They're not going to, if they tell you they can't perform their mind the first day of school, okay, that's fine. Next person, call on to the, call on there. Don't harp and be like, why can't you perform? Everyone is doing it. <laughs> Come on. Peer pressure does not work for kids like that, especially calling them out, right? Um, um, a lot of my students that start off like that, and this is high school, a lot of them start off and they tell me straight up, I cannot give a speech in front of my peers. And so we kind of make a pack. I was like, okay, that's fine. You don't have to give the first speech in front of you. Just give it to me. And they, you know, they come after school, they come, class ends. And if I have a conference period, um, um, they'll give their speech during my conference period. So just to me, me and Ms. just me and Miss Adiemi, and they'll stand and I'll be in the audience and you know um, critique them, and then eventually they'll give their speech. Um, somebody put meditation in there. Um, I think you said that your one of your students have breathing, uh, like breathing, and they sweat. Meditation is definitely good, and getting them to focus on something. Music is meditation. I, um, music, get, playing music for students or getting them to put on their air, air, they all have them, their AirPods, letting them play music, letting them go off and just talk, like walk, letting them walk, right? Especially, if they, and I'm talking about students at a tournament, just going on a walk. You can walk, you, just tell them to walk or you can walk with them while they listen to their music. You don't have to talk. Walking is like, like if, especially if they're really showing um, physical physical stage, right? Where they're sweating, they're, you know, gasping, they're having it almost a, to the part their panic attack. Just walk around the building and just calm them down. Tell them to count from 10 to one, one to 10, and just walk around with them while they do that. If they're at that stage of, of being very nervous. And I'll send some different brainstorms for what I would do for a client that is suffering from like extreme anxiety. Um, because, um, I see younger kids for like, I see three to 18. So, um, there, there's different things you can do. I would advise you when I was a middle school coach and I'm about to be one again, when I was in middle school with the middle school kids, uh, what kids love to do, they love playing games, always have some car, a card game or something to take their mind off of the fact that they're so frightened to go perform in their own, take them totally out of like, let's go play some cards. And so they can, so because what you're trying to get them from, you're trying to de, you're trying to re, um, deregulate them at that point, bring them back down. And I'll, and um, I'm gonna, and this is a book that will be on the PowerPoint. It's this uh, Tamra Chansky. It's freeing your child from um, anxiety. This is the second edition. This book is amazing. I'm gonna put it in the chat, and it also be on the PowerPoint that I send that they send out to you for this. It's called freeing, I'm putting it in the chat, freeing your child. Amazing book, get it on Amazon. And this is the second edition. She wrote um, uh, by um, Dr. Amar. Okay. This book is amazing. It's a quick read, but she gives you all the tools. You don't have to read the beginning because it's like counselor stuff, but she gives all the different activities that is on this PowerPoint. <laughs> um, but if you want all the activities, I gave a couple of them, but she gives some good activities about the calming mechanism. If you want to, um, about calming students down um, when they're at, when they're actually exhibiting where they can't even function anymore. And it's like, um, especially like a competition, competition stuff. So um, those she gives, it's called Practical Strategies to Overcome Fears, Worries, and Phobias from, and Be Prepared for Life from Toddlers to Teens. It's a great book. It's a really great book. So I would suggest if you want to be a worry-wise teacher, if you want to get some activities. Uh, and then 
I'm gonna what's the other website. If you want to go to, I know I was not, I was out of the country yesterday and just got back, but um, TEA is the Texas Education Agency. They have a training that you can get PD if you really want to really truly help your students. It's a really quick training. If you want to get PD hours for, hold on, let's put this. I'm on two different computers. Okay, I gotta find it. Um, let's just do this on my laptop. But it's a training by Project Restore. That's what it's called. Project Restore training. And it's about it really deals with trauma, but um it's good PD to have at this time. So it's called Project Restore. And um, understanding your students' experiences session. Um, session is the understanding your students. It's kind of what I went over. But um, if you really want to dig deep, they don't give that many activities as much as that book. The book is amazing. And then also, I will also have activities. Um, I want to, we can do an activity now that really I love. <laughs> and so, because we all have stress. I like, let's, let's all know that anxiety is great. And I do it with my students all the time. So let's go ahead and close our eyes. We'll close our eyes. I want you to go ahead and breathe in and one, two, three, four, five. Breathe out. Exhale. One, two, three, four, five. Breathe in. Breathe out. All right, you can open your eyes. That helps all the time, right? So I, you know, um, you can always do that with a child that's really, and it's just good to do it. Meditation is just good sometimes to do at the beginning of class. My students love it. Um, I would play, I play calm when they're studying or like if I'm not teaching that day and they're working on like research, I play calm study music. I'm weird like that, y'all. Music, I think, is powerful. So I, um, if you go to, um, if you have Spotify, Pandora, any of those um, uh, places that play things, just put in calm study music and try playing that while they're studying or reading or researching. It is amazing. Um, um, that really helps with anxiety as well. Sheila, did you have a question? I see your hand raised. Maybe her hand is just raised still from when we raised it earlier. All right, any other questions, you guys? Because I don't want to keep you. NSDA said I had an hour. <laughs> what hour? I think one of my observations that, I don't know, some parents put their kids in speech and debate to fix them, you know? Yeah, we're the fixers, right? <laughs> like kids, here's like, oh, he's shy. So I told him he should do speech and debate. And I'm like, great, shy kids, I love it. But um, I think, um, I don't necessarily think we're fixers, but you, I definitely know that speech and debate does transform. I know when my students come in, most of them, not everybody, look, you can't touch it, but you're not gonna reach every child. But I do know that when they come in, they do leave differently. And they tell me that, right? They do, they should leave differently. Either this, either, and this, and this is how they leave. This is definitely not for me. <laughs> this ain't for me, Miss A. This after it is like, this ain't for me, this ain't, this ain't for me. Or they stay with you till they're seniors or till they're eighth graders and move on to high school. I'm like, oh my God, this is so for me. And then what I really love is the kids. What, that aren't the national state finalists, champions, but it's still for them. And that's what it's all about. And we just gotta get every child, at least while, again, while they're with you, get them to that flocking stage. Thank you, Chelsea. All right, um, so hopefully, um, and, I'll, and I'll get that PowerPoint to y'all for sure. Tasha, please help me. I don't know where it is. <laughs> She's in the audience. <laughs> Um, any other questions or any comments or anything? Uh, 
Thank y'all so much. I'm gonna go ahead and let you go. And um, yes, I will get that PowerPoint to you for sure. And it'll have like um, um, scanned copies of activities you can do with your students as well from another, another uh, book that I have for teens.